tonight we get the uh, the opportunity, and I know Amos is Jim's favorite minor prophet. Amos is not my favorite. It's not that I don't like Amos. I like Amos a lot. My favorite is Micah, and we get to talk about Micah tonight. Um, and I imagine with all the minor prophets, if we pulled everybody in here, we would cover them all. Uh, they would all be covered in so it's, uh, but Micah is my favorite for a number of reasons, and, uh, and it's going to be a joy to speak on Micah this evening. Would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you for the night. We thank you for the day that you've blessed us with and the opportunities that we've had to worship and to study, to fellowship with one another, and to grow closer to you. Father, we pray that you'd watch over us as we study this precious book this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Micah, what a great book it is. It's seven chapters, and uh, it is filled with a number of things that may seem like repetition from some of the other prophets, but it has many unique things as well. Uh, the author is Micah of Morsheth Geth. Micah's name means who is like Jehovah. And I've often thought about that and wondered if his, uh, his parents named him who is like Jehovah, because there is no one who is like Jehovah. Or if they named him who is like Jehovah in hopes that he would grow up to be like Jehovah and, and reflect Jehovah. At any rate, his name is who is like Jehovah. And there are a number of uh, plays on words in Micah related to Micah's name. And we'll, we'll touch on at least one of those through the course of our uh, time. Uh, he prophesied during the reigns of uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, so about a 40 or so year period there between 740 and 700 B.C. And during the course of this time, he basically was the conscience of God's people in Judah and in Samaria. Uh, he spoke these things uh, as warnings and also a reiteration of the love that God had uh, for his people. He spoke during a time of religious upheaval. There was division between the northern and southern tribes. During the period of the time that he spoke, 722 B.C., the Assyrians came in and carried away the northern tribes. So right in the middle of his time of prophecy, it was a horrible event for the children of Israel. They were carried off because of their forgetfulness of God. The prophets, the priests, and the rulers were corrupt, with few exceptions during this period of time. Judah herself had grown, uh, grown tired of the sacrifices, the feast days, and ultimately they had grown tired of God. God was very wounded by their attitude towards him. And Judah still went to the temple and sacrificed, but it wasn't with a heart that was directed towards God. The purpose of the book is to warn the people of God of coming judgment for sin, but also to offer hope based upon the mercy of God. God is, uh, you know, when you read the prophets and you look at a timeline, God never went in there with a prophet and said, you guys better look out in the week, and a week later comes in there and wipes them out. Many times he gave generations of time for people to turn around before he ultimately punished them. He is so patient. And that's a beautiful part of the mercy and the grace of God that he extends time and opportunity to people to make changes. And he did the very same uh, with his people here. There are three key verses, and uh, I haven't done this necessarily with all of the, the books in the Old Testament, but there are three in particular that I, I want to touch on. The first is 5 and verse 2, where it is prophesied that the Christ, the Messiah, would be born in Jerusalem. This is the verse that the scribes came to Herod the Great with, matter-of-factly, not excitedly or anticipatory, of the coming of Christ and said, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, the Messiah is supposed to be born in, in Bethlehem. And it just, it was almost just like, okay, so what? 
Sadly, that was the attitude that many people had when Jesus came to the earth. And that's where he would be born. The second is uh, chapter 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Uh, That is basically a definition of true religion, uh, if you were looking for such, because it covers all the aspects. And we're going to return to that verse a little bit later in our lesson. And finally, at the conclusion of Micah, we have there the ultimate disposal of sin which begins, who is a God like you? Now, that's one of the plays on Micah's name. Micah means, who is like Jehovah? And so here's this this line, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea What a beautiful thought that is. You know, David in the psalm says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Here is a, he will cast our sins into the depths of the sea, to a place where where we cannot reach them any longer, nor can they come for us. And that, of course, was done at Calvary. That's where he, he took those sins and he cast them into the deep of the sea. Unfortunately, there's many people that will not take advantage of that that sacrifice and that payment for sin. There are really three sections, but uh, but two are what I'm going to outline here. Uh, The opening section uh, is really quite short, and so I didn't delineate it in our outline. The first is uh, the first round of judgment and salvation, and that goes from the beginning through uh, chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5 has 15 verses and it breaks down the first part of that goes through chapter 3 and verse 12 and it deals with apostasy and social sin in Samaria and in Judah so it's in the north and the south Um, some of the prophets focused on one or the other and Micah deals with both simultaneously in this particular setting the second part is God's word of salvation to his people beginning of chapter 4 through the end of chapter 5. And so in each of these two segments, we have the, the bad news and then the good news. The second round of judgment and salvation, beginning of chapter 6 through the end of the book in chapter 7, is God's indictment of his people. And then it ends with Micah's, Micah's lament ends in hope, which we've just read a portion of here just a moment ago. And so God leaves them with hope. Hope for a change in the way things are taking place. I have a number of things up here. I have a lot more up here than I want to say or that I'm going to have time to say. Like I said, I love this book, and there's just so much I would love to go into. Um, But for the sake of time and and opportunity, I I won't... uh, I won't make it too too pressing upon you. Um, I'm just going to have to let some of this go. And you guys do have to be at work next week, right? I do have to leave Thursday. (laughs) But I would like you to to take note of the fact that as you go into the book of Micah, you're going to notice it's, it's a courtroom scene. And God is taking his people to court, as it were. And God levels a complaint against his people in chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, where he says, Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint. And you strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent you before Moses, Aaron, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now. What Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. 
from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. He, he comes before them. He wants to know what it is that he has done that has caused them to be so weary. And the people respond to God in the next two verses. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Unfortunately, the people had a wrong idea. Their question showed an enormous misunderstanding of what it was that God was bringing against them. God did not want more sacrifices from them. As a matter of fact, God did not want any sacrifices from them if their hearts were not geared towards him. If their hearts were not in tune with him. You know, that would be like us, you know, going out and doing whatever we wanted to do and God bringing a complaint against us. Well, should we just take the Lord's Supper six times on Sunday then? Would that make you happy, God? That's ultimately what they're saying. Instead of humbling themselves before God, they, they, they basically say, well, what is it you want? We'll, just, we'll give you whatever you want. Almost like a parent who is annoyed with their children and gives them something that they know they shouldn't give them just to get them out of the way. God wanted sacrifice from people who were dedicated to him. That's what he desired from them. Because their sacrifices would be true sacrifices then, out of a love and appreciation for what, who God was and for what God had done for them. And so he begins in verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. You know, in, in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, Jeremiah prophesies uh, long after Micah, after the Assyrians had come in and, and cleared out the, the northern tribe of Israel. But he's speaking for the Lord, and he says, Seek the old paths and walk in them, which the Lord has revealed to you. Seek those old paths. In other words, God's been telling you all along what he wants. Just go back to what he said in, in the beginning. The sad part is in Jeremiah 6, 16, the, the concluding verse is the people answered and said, we will not walk in them. And that's, in essence, what the people are saying here in Micah's day. He has shown you what is good. And it's not, some, it's not a recent revelation. It's something he's been saying all along. This is what I want. This is what I want. You know, when Jesus comes along and, and he says, you have heard it said by them of old, you, you shall not murder, but I say whoever is angry without cause in his heart towards his brother has already committed murder, or the same with lust and the same with all of these other things. That he, he is not saying that what was written before was wrong. He's saying that everybody had externalized those things, and the law was intended to internalize and change us from the inside out. It wasn't just the physical act of adultery that was wrong. It was a heart that was geared towards those things, even if it never acted out. That harbored those things in the mind and in the heart. And God, from the beginning, has been telling people what he desires from them. And unfortunately, people continue to say, we don't want any part of it. And what does the Lord require of you here we have god's summation of true religion he says to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your god as an adult when i came back to the lord's church i had been six months or a little more faithfully involved and, and worship in the work of the church. And the brother who was teaching the youth group in North Carolina was sick and couldn't make it. And he asked me to, to teach the young people's class, the teenagers. 
and they were using a curriculum at the time. Um, and it was on this verse. That was the first class I ever taught when I came back to the church, was on Micah 6 8. And I really believe that Micah 6 8 sums up the entirety of the Bible as far as our attitude towards God. It, it is the summation of true religion. And there are other places where it is, enunci- uh, uh, it, it is uh, brought forward in the very same way. Slightly different words, different times, maybe even to different people. But God's saying the same thing over and over and over again. From the beginning, in the middle, and all the way down to the end. What does the Lord require of you? He requires you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I'd like for us to look at these things for just a moment. First of all, do justly, and that, that's to treat yourself right. Treat yourself right. We, we need to care for our physical bodies. Uh, as best we can physically, either with exercise or with Uh, seeking medical attention when we have issues, uh, eating well, uh, except when ice cream's being served. But it's got a lot of calcium in it. You guys know that, right? It's got calcium. I'm building up my bones because I expect to fall a lot as I get older and I need all the protection I can get. Um, But we, we, we need to care for our physical body. But we also need to care for our physical body in keeping it away from sin. That's what 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 is all about. Uh, to, to understand that our bodies are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ indwells us. And when we uh, take ourselves into sinful situations, especially sexual sins, as are being spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we are, in essence, taking the Holy Spirit into that situation with us. And so we need to care for our physical bodies. We need to treat ourselves right. We need to care for our mind and our heart. And these things are joined together in the Scripture. They both speak to the same uh, concept of the inward part of man. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul tells us that whatever things are, are just, lovely, praiseworthy, virtuous. He he goes down this whole list and he says, think or meditate on these things. We need to to spend our time with our minds, with our heart, focusing on the good things that God has revealed to us. And oftentimes we, we push the good out for something else. So we need to take care of our bodies we need to take care of our mind but we also need to take care of our soul jesus says in matthew 16 26 what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul bill gates bill gates does a, a lot of good benevolent work um bill gates is a uh, a very a uh, successful individual. I don't know where he is on the most uh, wealthy people in the world, but he's billionaire many tens of times over. When he goes to judgment, if he goes into judgment without the benefit of the blood of Christ, which my understanding is currently he does not possess, can he exchange those tens of billions of dollars? for the destination of his soul. He can't. You see those tens of billions of dollars? They already belong to God anyway. Everything's already his. And so you can't give God what is his in exchange for your soul. So we have to treat ourselves right. We have to do justly. We have to live in such a way. In the New Testament, justly would be in certain versions, be translated righteously. Right living before God. It's taking care of ourselves physically, taking care of our heart and mind, and taking care of our soul. The threefold part 
of mankind. We are to do justly. We are to love mercy. To love mercy is to treat others right. <clears throat> and you know, Ephesians 4.32, at the conclusion of a section where the Christians were being told not to lie to each other, not to steal from each other, not to use corrupt speech, all of, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, all of these things that their attitudes and actions were causing harm to each other and harm to God. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's loving mercy. Kind, tenderhearted, forgiving. That's the exact opposite of the behavior that we see in those previous verses. And then he goes on at the beginning of chapter 5 to say, to be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. That's what we are to do. And so we're to love mercy. You know, when we, when we talk about justice and mercy and grace, justice is getting what you deserve. That's what justice is. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. You see, that's the difference. And so when you throw yourself on the mercy of the court, you're asking the court to not give you what you deserve, whatever your level of punishment is for running a stop sign or a murder or whatever in between that you, you've done. But grace is getting what you don't deserve, and we do not deserve heaven. We do not deserve forgiveness. We do not deserve reconciliation with God. We do not deserve those things, but God offers those things through Jesus Christ. And so, if we're going to love mercy, we're not going to give people what they deserve. We're going to give them... Uh, we're not going to give them what they deserve in, in punishing them. We're going to give them what we would want if we were in their position and they were in ours. That's what Matthew 7 and verse 12, the golden rule. Anybody have a 12-inch a ruler at home that still has it on there? They used to issue them in school. You remember? And you show up day one, and there's a 12-inch wooden ruler. And it would say, do unto others as you would do unto you, uh, uh, as you would have them do unto you. And then it would have up beside it, the golden rule. That's from Matthew 7, verse 12. It reads a little differently than that. Therefore, whatever you would that men do to you, do likewise also unto them. In other words, treat others the way you would want to be treated if you were in that circumstance. That's loving mercy. That, that's, that's the type of people we should be. You know, there's, there's so much hate. There's so much so much condemnation. Even in the church. Sadly. We need to Love as God has loved us. And that's, uh, and I'm, I, I don't mean to sound uh, like it's an oxymoron because it is impossible to love like God has loved us. But we should strive to love in that way. But it's impossible for us to do because we have offended as well as being offended. God has never offended because he has not sinned. And so it's, it's, we cannot quite reach there, but that's got to be our goal. Loving mercy, treating people right. You know, I'm, I haven't always done a good job with that. I imagine all of us have struggled with that from time to time. But we, we need to do the best that we can every day to maybe do better than we did the day before and keep becoming more like Christ with each passing day. We are to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. We're to treat ourselves right, we're to treat others right, and we're to treat God right. That's in essence what Micah is revealing to us that the Lord has said.
to treat God right. Humbly. We are to fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, what is it that you want? Do you want tens of thousands of rivers of oil? That's not what God's asking us to do. God wants us to love him back. He wants us to love him back for what he's done for us. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Our love is a reciprocal love of God. God did not sacrifice Jesus for us because we came and loved him first. He loved us first, and he loved us perfectly. We need to treat him right. We need to fear God and keep his commandments. We need to obey God. If we say that we know God, we will keep his commandments. We need to obey him. You know, one of the ways that we show appreciation to our parents is when they ask us to take out the garbage, what do we do? We go to our room and start playing video games, right? Yep, that's how we show our parents we love them. No, you go take the garbage out. Or you do do something. Or even more than that, they've asked you to do it in the past and you see the need, and now they don't even have to ask you to do it. You just do it instinctually. And that's how our obedience to God should be. It should not be in every circumstance. We sit there and go, well, has God commanded anything here? I don't see any commands, so I guess I can do what I want to do. No, we look at the situation in light of the things that God has told us and we act and react accordingly out of love. Love for God. Our obedience to him is not about, well, 10,000 rivers of oil and thousands of rams. That's not what it is at all. It's about loving God enough to, to do what he's asked. It's really simple really pretty simple and we need to worship God not just fearing him not just obeying him but giving him honor giving him praise giving him adulation and adoration for who he is even if he never did anything for us he's deserving of but also for what he's done because he did that which we could never have hoped for. Jesus in his three temptations, the third one listed in Matthew, Satan tells him to bow down before him and he'll give him all these kingdoms and Jesus says, away with you for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Worship, that word there, proskuneo, in the uh, original language, literally means to bow your head to the floor, to the ground, or to kiss towards the hand, to pay homage. And so if we're going to treat God right, we're going to humble ourselves and fear God. We're going to humble ourselves and obey God. And we're going to humble ourselves and we're going to worship God. This is God's definition or summation of true religion. You know, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus was tested asking what is the greatest commandment in the law, and he says, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. And the second is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God. Treat God right. Love your neighbor. Treat others right as yourself. Treat yourself right. There it is in the greatest commandment. Or as Paul writes to to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present age. 
soberly. Treat yourself right. Justly here is how we treat others, treating others right. Godly, treating God right. You see, God never changed. He never changed. He's told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I love Micah. And Micah chapter 6 is really the pivotal verse in all of this prophecy. Because it, it pertains as equally today in its principle and application as it did to those all those years ago before Jesus ever came. Because this is something that God taught from the beginning. He taught it in the middle. And here he teaches it to those of us who have inherited the ends of the ages. This Christian age. He's still teaching us these three things. I hope this lesson has proved beneficial to you. It may have been more confirming than uh, affirming. But at the same time, we need to be reminded of these things. We need to be reminded, especially in a nation that... Um, it has its problems, and a lot of those problems are becoming more public now. What are we going to do? Are we going to go find bottles and break them over people's heads or take signs and beat people down and scream and holler and call names? And, or are we going to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? You know, when we walk humbly with our God, we're going to be very different than the world. Very different from the world. And I think that's what God expects us to do. That doesn't mean when we see something that requires our attention to, to help correct, that, that we don't do something about that. Because one of the problems were uh, social injustices during the time of Micah. The, the rich and the priests were all taking advantage of the poor. And the rulers were. And so we want to speak out against those things, but we, we could do so in a way that honors God and walk humbly with him. Who is like Jehovah? Here we are tonight, and, and I ask you the question, how many of us are like him? None of us. None of us are. But hopefully we're striving to be more and more like him with each passing day. And in joining these three basic principles from Micah 6, 8 will help us in that regard. If you're here tonight and and maybe you've stumbled in one or, or all of these, and, and you want to make some things right tonight, please seek to do that. Our brother's going to lead us in a song here in just a moment. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you, encourage you in some way. Or if you're here tonight and you've not obeyed the gospel, you've never put on Christ in baptism, we would love the opportunity to talk to you about that as well. If you have a need, whatever it may be, whether small or great, please make it known to us as together we stand and sing.